So, if I think of the financial crisis, I'm mainly thinking about the credit crunch and the things that arose from 2007 onwards. So for the past four years, since the uh, market started becoming disturbed in the middle of 2007, through to today, perhaps a little bit of a brief lull in the middle of 2009, uh, financial markets have been in crisis almost continuously. And um, this is quite a significant event. If you go back historically, we've had some studies, you can look, you find that there have been a number of financial crises arisen in the past. And um, the way that we've chosen to define them, you've basically have two kinds. You have a, a normal kind which lasts about two years, and then you have really bad ones that last about four years with a, a slight dip in the middle. This one's lasted more than four years already and might yet go on for a while longer. It, this would be, on, it, uh, on the analysis that we've done, the longest uh, and most serious financial crisis uh, that data allows us to identify. Uh, so why, why has that occurred? A thing that I want to say is, so I'm going to give you an account of why this has occurred. Um, actually, uh, although the problem may not have come across it very much, um, the, account, the account that I'm uh, going to offer isn't actually nearly so heterodox as it might seem to you. So I'm a pretty orthodox uh, kind of economist, probably rather more orthodox than a number of other people that you've heard today. Uh, and I do a lot of work with bodies like the European Parliament, the European Commission, the Financial Services Authority, have done for many years. Uh, and in fact, the analysis which I'm going to do has appeared in the European Parliament report. So although it's um, different from uh, other things that you might have come across, uh, that's not necessarily because it's odd. Also, the other thing about that I would say about that is that what I'm going to offer you is a reflection of orthodox economic Theory. So I'm not going to say the issue here is the economists have all got it wrong, right? Forever in some this so there's this reason or that reason why mainstream economics is wrong. I'm going to offer you what I consider to be the orthodox mainstream economist account of what's caused the financial crisis. So fundamentally, in um, orthodox standard finance theory, you get finite day crises of these sort when you have. Uh, an initial overestimation of the value of some assets or an underestimation of the risks associated with those assets and subsequently you update your opinion. So you thought something was worth more, later you think it's worth less. Initially you thought it was a low risk thing you held, later you decide that it's risky and so when you update your opinion the value of those things goes down. Associated with a big fall in the value of certain assets, there were then all kinds of spillover effects which are still being worked out in financial markets as a consequence. But that fundamental reason, right, so there's that fundamental factor, and I'm wanting to give you some reasons why I think that particular issue has arisen. Why did you get this overvaluation of assets, under that underestimation of risk, and then which then led subsequently to an updating, a reduction in the view of the values. So, I'm going to identify for you um, eight key factors associated with that. So the first is, it's a fun, fairly fundamental reflection of innovation. So all through history, when you have innovations, very often people underestimate initially how much new, uh, new things are worth. So for example, it's quite likely that that was the case in terms of the uh, personal computer. So when personal computers first came along, um, Although people did think that they would have some impact on productivity and so on, it seems to me that later, as in the 90s and 2000s, people then changed their minds and actually they thought that they were having more of an impact. So they underestimated the value of them to start with, and then later, when they updated, they increased the value of their assets. When that kind of thing occurs, you don't, although that happens most of the time, the consequences are fairly benign and fairly non disruptive because some people that um, end up being richer and that people tend not to complain so much when that happens if they end up being richer than they initially anticipated. Um, but every now and then, so I think that that's most of the time that happens, every now and then though, you get a situation in which people, in, 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 in innovation turns up, initially people think it's worth a certain amount, and later they then downgrade how much they think it's worth. That, for example, I think was probably the case with the railways in the 19th century, perhaps the case with um, a light bulb, maybe with uh, some parts of radio and wireless, uh, maybe with the dot-com companies in the, in the internet uh, at the turn of the 20th to 21st century. So when you get those kind of episodes, then you get an initial period when things are looking better, you get a downgrade, and because of that downgrade, some people lose money, and so there are some defaults associated with that, and that can lead to problems, because when people uh, default, 
when they lose so much money that they're going to default on their own debts, their own obligations to others, you get spillover impacts into the wider society as a consequence of that. A key form of financial innovation that occurred during the, actually during the 1980s, but then became particularly popular during the uh, 2000s, was some particular sorts of derivatives in financial markets. I won't go into too many gory details about them, but uh, a key thing which they were supposed to do, uh, which I think that they actually did, was that they diversified the risk. So a simple example of this was that um, if I, have, if I uh, sell mortgages, if I have an individual mortgage, and that, the person who holds that mortgage then defaults, then I make a loss. Whereas if what I do instead is that I hold one one millionth piece of one million mortgages, then an individual's default is then spread right across a whole load of people. Right? So as a consequence, we get a diversification of the impact. So instead of, if I happen to be the unlucky guy, if only one person defaults, I'm the unlucky sucker who uh, serves the consequence of that. Instead, we spread the consequence of that one default across um, a whole load of uh, investors. So that, that was a certain sort of financial product they, that, that did that. It did reduce risk. I do believe that they reduced risks. Uh, and as a consequence of that reduced reduction in risks, people found that it was attractive to hold and invest in certain of these products more than they might have done in the past. It's just I think that people overestimated how much they genuinely reduce risks. So that particular sort of innovation wasn't worth quite as much as people thought it was at the time. That's one, one illustration of that. There were a number of other financial innovations. It's also the case, I think, that certain financial innovations were associated, so people became very bold in some of the mathematical apparatus associated with them. So some of them, where people, some of them would work quite well, and they were quite valuable in normal times, and then that they created risks. There were things that could go wrong with them themselves, and I think that that was, a, that was another kind of problem. Some of the mathematical underpinnings of them worked in, in a normal case, but then they didn't work very well in special cases, and that created a problem with the special case arose, as it happened to. A second thing that I would say um, is, a, is a key factor, so this, this is a sort of fundamental positive, it's just one of those things, factors that I've described so far. I couldn't really do that much about it. However, although I think that there would have been some um, some kinds of uh, problems, some losses probably, even if markets had been working perfectly, even if regulation had been perfect, the reality is that a number of regulatory interventions made what would have otherwise been a um, significant problem into a real disaster. So the first of these that I would identify is a thing I call regulatory badger. So it actually goes back to the, the gentleman's question at the, in the last session. So what, if I'm, when, when I was a teenager, I might have been sceptical about all kinds of government intervention. The one that I thought that everybody should always accept was the merits of regulatory badging, of kite marking. Who could object? What could be more benign from the government than to be, than to be involved in kite marking? Right? So if you've got your eggs or whatever, rather than having lots of individual inspectors hire all kinds of different people come around with competing systems where they say these eggs are okay, why not have the government, as one ground agency, say these eggs are okay, providing a government kite mark? You don't even have to ban right, all the other kite marks, we can have competition. But at least if the government produces its own kite mark, its own standard saying these eggs aren't infected, then or the risk of these eggs being infected is accept accept acceptable, that seems a pretty benign thing to do. Right? It's overcoming some free riding issues and coordination problems. What could be bad about that? Well, here's what could actually be bad about that. I mean, I, I, I'm not the young artist, but he's like the Financial Services Authority, so I'm on this point a sort of sinner turned, right? Arguing for the merits of regulatory budgeting. You'll hear this to that, you'll see that turn turn up in almost any report I wrote to it for a, nearly a decade. So, what's the problem with this, though? Well, one of the problems is, if I say, look, what's going to happen? So, there was a process in financial markets, in, in, particularly in uh, retail financial services, that's the provision of things like mortgages and other things. From the mid-1980s, people chased out what's called the caveat emptor principle, the buyer beware. So in most markets, if you don't want the stuff that you buy, that's your problem, right? It's for you as the purchaser to beware if you don't like the product. The buyer beware principle was basically eliminated from financial services from the, uh, the mid-1980s onwards, because it was decided that more, mere mortals such as ourselves were they're not capable of assessing uh, financial services products because they were all terribly complex, partly. But not only were they terribly complex, but we, in many cases, we would only purchase them once, or if they went sufficiently badly wrong, 
we'd only end up purchasing them once. So that some of the issues might the repeat sales effect wouldn't be there. So you go to a restaurant uh, and you don't buy the restaurant service, then you don't go back to the restaurant again. But if you buy a pension, and when the pension turns up, it doesn't pay, it's not like you're going to go and have another life where you save up for your pension again. Uh, because of the nature of the product, it was difficult to use some of the mechanisms which in other, part, in other kinds of markets would help to, um, to, to address uh, potential problems of you not being able to observe exactly in advance what it was that the supplier was providing to you. So, uh, but if you do that, if what happens is that the regulator then comes in and provides a batch and the regulator says, I say that this is okay, and then the regulator gets it wrong, the regulator's got it wrong for everybody. Right? That's a key point. So if we have lots of individual analysis and individuals get it wrong, well, some, maybe some people get it wrong, maybe some people get it right. If we have lots of different agencies doing their assessments, they might use different methods and so on. Some might get it wrong, others will get it right. If we just have one grand agency that's saying, these things are okay, and to all of you retail purchasers of products and whatever, you should all trust them, and they get it wrong, they're getting it wrong for everybody. So one of the consequences of regulatory badging is that you create a systemic coordination of error right across the market. Another thing that occurred that was connected with this was that we had international coordination of regulation. So it's not merely a matter of that we coordinated across the market, but because we end up doing the same thing in lots of different countries, we coordinate these effects internationally. I don't believe it was a coincidence that at the peak of international collaboration on regulation with the, uh, the introduction of what was called the Basel II rules for the banking sector, that, 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 that we ended up with the most internationally coordinated financial crisis of all time. It seems to me that very clearly those kind of things are connected. This business of regulatory badging didn't only occur at the retail level, so I've been describing things with customers, right, with these people. The other way that it occurred was at what's called the wholesale level. So people in financial markets who are um, taking money from others and then producing, this, so they're uh, interacting not with the final consumer, nor are they interacting with the initial investor, but they're doing something in between. Those people were um, developed a system of regulatory batching through things called ratings agencies. So these, the ratings agencies were intimately connected, in fact, with regulation. So your particular capital requirements and so on were connected with exactly how ratings agencies viewed you. So these ratings agencies then, now, uh, then became the regulatory badges at the wholesale level. I could say lots of other things about ratings agencies. I don't share some of the critiques that other people have of them. But this fundamental point that they have used fairly similar techniques, relatively few of them, they're then mandated to be involved in regulation in this way, creates uh, coordination from their point of view as well. In fact, um, it's actually very bad from the ratings agency's point of view that they were so intimately connected with regulation. Because one of the consequences of that is that it's very hard for the ratings agency then subsequently to update its view. Uh, right? So think about it like this. If I've got a bank and the bank, let's caricature it and say that the bank was required to hold certain, we'll call them AAA, right? high grade assets of some sort. And so let's suppose that they were required by regulation to hold some assets which are deemed AAA by ratings agencies. The ratings agency then picks some fancy financial products, derivatives or whatever, these innovative products, and calls them, says that they are AAA rated. If it then changes its view and decides that they're not worth as much, so it fancies downgrading them, what would be the consequence for the bank? Well, the bank will then find that it no longer holds adequate amounts of AAA rated assets. It's become dependent on them. Right? The, the government had said they had to hold them, they then gone and held them. If the ratings agency downgrades them, the bank's going to be screwed. Well, if you're a ratings agency and there's only two or three of you, are you going to downgrade those assets until you're absolutely certain that that stuff is going down? Well, no, you're not, because if you downgrade them, and that then leads to some collapses of some banks and some wider financial crisis, you're going to be up before some congressional committee, quick, smart, pronto. Right? They're going to be saying, look at the irresponsible behaviour, and we're going to have some trust-busting action against you. You're going to be kicked out. Your role in the regulatory process is going to be eliminated, and so your ability to function as a ratings agency will be gone as well. So they could only, the ratings agencies could only downgrade these assets once they knew that sucker was going down, which of course retarded. It meant that you, the, the point at which they would downgrade them. It also meant that uh, participants in financial markets have an extended period in which you have a very pure market making. 
So I know people who traded in some of these products who thought they were absolute rubbish. And they traded with people who thought they were absolute rubbish. But nobody cared that they thought they were absolute rubbish. Right? From it, what, because the, the, that particular person thought it was absolute rubbish. It wasn't his job to have an opinion because the agency made the market. It said this was the amount. Other people had to have it, so he had to sell that. The fact that he thought it was rubbish was neither here nor there. You create this coordination of risk as a consequence. The other thing that was associated with that um, is that, just, sorry, just one, one remark on that. So I've criticized, I've said that by coordinating um, error across the market through using regulatory fashion and by coordinating internationally through international coordination of regulation, you've created an internationally coordinated systemic risk. It isn't obvious, of course, that that means it's bad, right? Because there were some good reasons why you wanted to introduce the regulatory badges and the international coordination in the first place. So it might be that you gained more on the, on the swing, right, of the, the good reasons than you lost on the downside of the systemic coordination, right? You might prefer to overcome the free riding problems and so on and yet bear the, the systemic coordination. A criticism I would have, though, of regulators is that subsequent to these events, they haven't gone and thought about this again. So, in all, in, without any apparent sense of irony, I, I regularly go to conferences and regularly come and um, write reports and, and, and read reports where people say, well, we've had the most, so we had all this international coordination of regulation, we had the most internationally coordinated financial crisis of all time, and the solution, obviously, is to have more international coordination of regulation. And they don't see that, they, it's not even that they are kind of taking it on the chin and arguing that for some coherent reason. They just don't seem to see the irony in what they're saying at all, which, which seems to me to be um, somewhat remiss. The thing that I would say is that it, once, you, once you take on this duty, of course, and you chase out all the caveat attempt or all the buyer beware aspect, all the individual analysis, that creates a huge burden on the regulator then to do lots of su supervision of the risk management and so on of all the companies, because nobody else is going to do it. Right? The retailer, the guys who are buying the products aren't going to be doing it, the guys who are providing the money aren't going to be doing it, the guys in between aren't going to be doing it. So if the regulator doesn't do the supervision, no one else is going to be. And the regulators didn't seem to grasp that point. Actually, they wouldn't have been very well placed to do the supervision anyway. Right? It wasn't a very good idea, it would be much better to make use of the health at all. But that's, a, but that's an aspect of the thing. The next thing that I would say is that you had a whole series of regulatory get-arounds. So a classic thing that happens in regulation is that a regulator sees something and then the market responds in some way that so they introduce a regulation because they don't like something that happens. The market then responds by changing its behavior to get around the regulation. And the regulator then thinks, oh, okay, well the problem here is that, I, that I've forgotten about this. So they introduce a new regulation over here to get this. Well, of course the market reacts by finding another way to get around that as well. That's just a fundamental feature of the way that markets go. That's not markets going wrong. That's markets responding to incentives as economists would predict that they should do. So, uh, and there were a number of regulatory get-arounds as a consequence of um, regulations that have been introduced at early stages. What some of those regulatory get-arounds did was that they moved activities from places where before the regulation was introduced to forbid things from happening, they were transparent so people could see so at least, you know, you may not like it, but you can see what's happening here. Then the regulation comes in, and it goes over here, behind the curtain. And so it isn't that the activity stops, it just went somewhere else. And it went to somewhere worse, where you couldn't see what was going on. That, I think, was another uh, important activity, um, thing that happened. Um, the next thing that I would identify is that there were certain weaknesses in the way that monetary policy regimes were set up that meant that we had an extended period of very, very low interest rates. So there are two kinds of things that one would identify particularly here. One is a, a regime called inflation targeting, which is the main sort of trendy monetary policy regime that's been in place for the past 20 years. The other is um, uh, the introduction of the euro. So those are the two key things that I would identify as driving periods of very low, uh, very low interest rates. So inflation targeting, creates a certain sort of, automatically creates a certain kind of credit cycle. The reason is that if you, um, if under an inflation targeting regime, they have very high credibility, that means that people really believe you're going to keep the, the inflation rate as, as is promised, then policymakers are able to respond to that by saying, well, if anything goes wrong, right, so I get a shock, I have a downturn, the economy will grow a bit slower, 
what I'll do is I'll cut interest rates. I'll produce some extra liquidity. I'll print some extra money, effectively. So I create some extra money as a consequence. Now, if they didn't have much credibility, then what would happen with that extra money is it would go and purchase some goods today, some extra products, and inflation would go up. But actually, because they have credibility, people think, well, if the inflation were to start to go up, they'll raise interest rates in Titan. And, the, and they promised that that's what they would do. If they raise interest rates in Titan, then I'm not going to have so much cash tomorrow. So what I'd better do then is take my money and instead of buying some goods with it, I'll put it over here, I'll save it, I'll put it in some other asset against the evil day when, the, when they honour their promise and tighten up. So for as long as they maintain credibility, the, banks are able to, the, the central banks are able to provide excess liquidity into the market, always based on some implicit promise that this year, next year, sometime never, they're going to really tighten. And when they really tighten, you're going to need some cash, and so you better hold some cash over in financial assets. What that means is that then people use the money to buy houses, or they buy um, uh, stocks and all kinds of other things, and you get a big boom in financial assets without getting inflation. And the policymakers, if they don't, if they're not alive to this, they'll look around and they'll say, no, there's not really any inflation. Got a big boom in asset prices, everyone's feeling rich, things are going pretty well, right? So maybe I don't really need to tighten. And of course it's made more complicated by the fact that, okay, when, when people do standard uh, uh, models, like right, standard kind of models here, you use various techniques so that you end up with a solution. Because it's very difficult to work out. And how to solve anything, come up with any answers if you say, well, there are an infinite set of solutions to this. How would you know how to recommend any kind of policy? So many standard models at least have a concrete number of solutions. But in practice, you could type them today, you could type them a bit more tomorrow, you could type them more the day after that, you could type them a heck of a lot, right? A long time after that. And so they never, it's never quite the case that the central banks so have lied. And you see, until until they really lose credibility, until people stop believing that they can really set the interest rates high enough to, to take things out, then nobody's, then it's not really going to be the case that they that you can really say that they've lied. And I think that a key thing that happened in 2708 was that um, in the financial markets, people started to doubt whether central banks would really be able, in the end, to raise interest rates enough. Once you start to doubt it, whether the interest rates will go up enough, then money will co go out of financial assets and then go into commodities. They won't quite go to goods straight away, but they'll start to leak across. So what you should expect to see then is something like a huge spike in oil prices or commodity prices as they're going not, they're not quite just in financials anymore, but they're in kind of the next best thing, like commodities, almost things connected. And so you get this huge spike up. And that, that, I think, is the kind of thing which, if one had really understood it to start with, one would have said was always going to be a consequence of inflation targeting. It creates these cycles right, uh, automatically. The other thing, of course, was the introduction of the euro, which, um, without proper state apparatus that went with it, which meant that in certain places within the eurozone, you ended up with um, uh, very, very low interest rates for an extended period particularly the case in Ireland, Spain, ended up with these very, very low interest rates, which then set off great kinds of asset booms as a consequence. I'm going to unpack that any more today. So the last thing that I would talk about is something which, which is in, in some ways the most important, but I didn't want to talk about it first because I didn't want to give you the impression that this was really the only thing. Right? But in many ways, the most important factor is governments have been expected to intervene in various ways to limit downside risk. So there are two, two illustrations of that I think are particularly important. The first is that government's political fortunes have come to be seen to be in, 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 more and more over time connected with the performance of housing markets. So people expected, they thought, so governments boasted of how well they did when house prices went up and when house prices went down, governments got blamed for that as a consequence. The more the government took responsibility for house prices, the more likely it was that if house prices ever fell, then governments would intervene in some way to make sure that they didn't fall. So the better, the less downside risk there's then going to appear to be associated with anything to do with housing. So for example, if I have some very fancy financial product and it's based on housing, 
then as well as all the other issues I've described, which something to do with mortgages, then you're going to have the aspect that, in the limited case, the government will come in and save them all anyway. So that's one kind of uh, important uh, area. The other, of course, is the tendency for governments to feel that they had to intervene to spare the creditors of banks. Now, it had been for some time that the, the governments had tended to uh, be interested in sparing the depositors of banks. In fact, it's, it's not always really been so. Right? Most people, aren't, I don't think, are aware in Britain that there was no deposit insurance, whatever. Right? No zero deposit insurance in the UK until 1979. And it only came in in 1979 as a consequence of a European Union directive. And when we had it right through 2007, we only had to have the absolute minimum that was mandated for us under the European Union directive. We had never believed in deposit insurance. It didn't really work with our, with our uh, uh, traditions of financial regulation. It was a very alien thing to us. Now, um, the, the other kind of thing that had happened was that, so as well as an extension of the deposit insurance and a gradual sort of eliding into a thought that um, policymakers would find it impossible to allow depositors to lose any money. Why isn't altogether clear, but that they did feel that. Um, uh, I see that's perhaps a little unfair. The, the, there is a reason why. A key reason why is that from the early 1970s, um, policymakers encouraged people to become more banked. So only around half the population had bank accounts at that point. Over time, policymakers positively almost drove everybody to be using bank accounts because when people were paid through cash in hand and so on, then it was much easier to do things like fiddle taxes. And so because of the role, so policymakers had deliberately encouraged people to become more and more banked. The more the policymakers tried to drive people into having banks, I suppose, the more responsibility that they felt for uh, that as a consequence. Um, but uh, the... The, uh, in some ways, though, more important than the deposit aspect was the aspect of bondholders. So the other kind of debt which banks had, and a form of debt which had increased very considerably, was people that lent money directly to banks. It's not just the loans which banks receive from deposits, because of course deposits are loans. Bank deposits in a normal high street bank is a loan. It's not your money. M most people, 92% of people, believe that when they put money in a bank, the money is their money as if a bit like I left my suit at a dry clean, this is still my suit. Absolutely not. A deposit in a bank is not yours, like your suit is still yours, or your car is still yours if you leave it with the car at the, 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 the workshop. And a deposit is a loan you make to a bank, and loans can go bad. The other kind of loan that they received were a thing called bonds. So that was a different kind of form of loan that banks received more directly through financial markets. From the mid-1980s, bondholders which hadn't ever historically had any protection in banks from the government, started to be bailed out more and more. The first case was at the Bank of Continental Illinois in the 1980s. And then over time, more and more, the tendency came to be to feel that when a bank got into trouble, you had to save the bondholders as well. Of course, if your bondholders of your banks, the providers of debt to banks, feel that they have a government guarantee, then that's great from their point of view, right? They're going to provide all the debt that a bank wants. So the normal sorts of things that would discipline, for example, the leverage that a bank had, are gone. So normally, companies have some limitations on how much leverage they can obtain, because people aren't going to provide debt to them. Or at some point, as they provide more and more debt, the price that they'll, that they'll provide it to them will get very high. But in the case of banks, that wasn't really so, right? You could just lend to a bank as long as you liked. Right? You keep lending to a bank because of the uh, because of the government guarantee. And in fact, more than that, the bank would then respond once it got to the absolute limit of um, leverage that was mandated, because at some point then, regulations would say, well, you've got to hold at least this much extra, right? You can't go above this amount of debt. Well, then they're going to respond by increasing their size instead of increasing their leverage. So they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's where the extra money is going to go. And that process will continue up to the point at which um, you had so much riskiness at the banks that the government itself would start to become a risky entity. As risky as the bank would have been if you'd just um, been operating without the government guarantee. And I think that's very relevant, for example, for the case of Ireland. Right? That you keep lending to the bank up to the point at which it's the government itself which is becoming the risky entity. Um, 
And that's associated with this huge rise in the assets, the balance sheets of banks, relative to some uh, two countries. Uh, and it's also an expansion factor, I think, for why you get such enormous differences between countries. So, for example, in the US, the total banking sector is less than 100% of GDP, because although the US government did intervene, people thought, felt that there was some limitation to that. In the UK, in Ireland, other places where they felt there was much less limitation, more like 400%. Much, much larger banking sectors relative to the economies. Um, uh, another thing that they will do if you eliminate the uh, risks to bonds is that whereas normally bondholders would discipline companies in terms of the way that they manage themselves internally and, for example, the way that they pay their staff, the bondholders won't have any interest in doing that anymore. So, when, when once upon a time a bondholder, right, so you've got a company, if, if the bondholders before they lend you the money, if they, if they looked at your company's prospectus and whatever, and, and if they said, well, we pay our staff this way and we take these sorts of risks, and they didn't like it, then they come in and they say, well, if you want to borrow money from us, then you'll have to change these things. But they're not going to do anything there, right, if, if they've got government guarantees. So you end up with a rise in the risk practices in the banks. The last thing that I would identify here is that you tend to get um, excess uh, over-merging in the entities. So the banks will combine themselves the reason that they will do that is that they want to make sure that they're so big that governments will find it really painful to let them go bust, to get over-merging in the sector. So, just to reiterate, right, so I've identified for you there a series of factors which are perfectly standard, ordinary financial theory reasons why you might have expected there to be a tendency for banks to become very large, for financial market participants to purchase a lot of some new innovations, a lot more even than they might have done over and above otherwise, and to focus on particular sectors such as housing. You don't need to go off to the kinds of things which other people want to appeal to, where people suggest that, oh, these show that the whole of finance theory is all rubbish, and so we'll just throw it all away. Lord Turner wrote an amazing report. Um, the, he's the head of the Financial Services Authority. He wrote an extraordinary report in March 2009, alleging, which basically abandoned the whole of modern finance theory without even mentioning the names of the people who came up with it, which I thought was uh, a bit much. Uh, and other people make all kinds of uh, other claims about how these show that the, the communists were always right or whatever. You don't need to go to any of those things. We can explain these things using ordinary, orthodox, long thought through, decades analysed, highly authoritative financial theories. The financial crisis is not, in that sense, a mystery. Of course, on my explanation may not be complete, and people were spending decades honing and proving these things. But I think this kind of analysis is the right place to start. Okay, we still have time for a few questions. Uh, okay, first hand was there. Sorry, JP, just. Thank you. Um, on bank regulation in the UK, I just want to um, when you think of the Bank of England absorbing the FSA into smaller regulatory groups focused on, you know, consumers in the financial sector like the FBC and the CPMA, and whether you think this is a good direction for regulation in the UK? So, in, in my view, and I, I've been an advocate of the, uh, of the view that says that in prudential regulation, that is when the, when the financial regulators take a view as to the amounts of capital that banks hold and whether they're behaving in a prudent manner, um, the, uh, the way to think about that is that the central bank might, if push comes to shove, in a, uh, our sort of paper money currency system, need to provide cash to banks under some circumstances. So you have a system, I think we should think of um, the, a, a central bank that is, a, is responsible for notes and the banks that come out fall under its supervision as a almost closed system. That they, they are engaged in a cooperation. The central bank needs to provide that last resort lending. It only should do that if you're a worthy recipient of it. Right? So if you're bust, the central bank shouldn't provide you any cash. Or if you've got into this because you were taking lots of chances with your liquidity, which, were, which was just your own choices, cost-cutting measures, the bank shouldn't provide you any cash. So the bank should take a view in advance as to whether you're behaving in a way which means if push comes to shove, it's going to provide you some cash. You, so it seems to me that prudential regulation is intimately connected with the provision of the central bank last resort function. What happened uh, in the past 15, 20 years is that we developed the idea that banking, that these prudential regulations, was something which you could 
some guy off in, um, in Switzerland could write down a little formula, and then that formula could just be applied. So then we had a division between the, um, the ultimate setting internationally, the standard setter for these things, and then you have uh, an enforcer, the FSA, that's nothing to do with the central bank at all. I think that that's just a mistake, right? a, a, badly, a badly conceived idea. I'm very glad to see that we're going back to having the lender of last resort being responsible for prudential regulation. I also think that a lender of last resort should be able to exercise more discretion. It's, there's a, an aspect of common sense and so on associated with these things. In, I'll give you a key example of that. You couldn't have, a for, if you have a formulaic regulation, it's very difficult to know when you're going to allow people to break it. For example, to have a level of capital that's below the capital requirement mandate. And, but the capital's there as a buffer. There are going to be circumstances where you want to let them go below. If you say, well, this is a hard threshold and I'm going to shut you down if you ever go below it, then you're going to be shutting them down and creating problems for them in all kinds of circumstances you shouldn't. Whereas if you have this more relationship-based, supervisory-based uh, arrangement with the central bank, then you can make it work. Can I get a sense of how many people have questions? If everybody's got a question, raise their hand. Ah, okay. Five, maybe ask three or something? Yeah, um, okay, we've got probably about five minutes. Should we take, take them in a minute? Three at a time, I'll start Yeah, okay, so first three, one, two, and then three. If we can just take short questions one after the other, and then we'll answer them in one go. This one's really quick. Uh, what do you think of the current policy move to separate uh, retail banking from investment banking? Okay, and... Yeah, just uh, pass it forward then, please. Uh, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I guess my question is, you will outline two ways of regulation. First, by the awareness of individual scale, and secondly, sort of aggregate um, government on a scale. And obviously, that you outline both have positives and negatives. Um, but do you think there's a third way that probably has more positives than negatives that possibly sort of in between the two? I guess that's the question. Okay, and was there another question in that facility? Yeah. Oh. No? Okay, do we just take those two then? Okay, so uh, I'm a, I was, I've always opposed retail and investment banking split. I think it's the sledgehammer that misses the nut. So what happens with that is that, um, first of all, of course, you destroy a form of banking, universal banking, in which the UK is a global leader, so you have an industrial policy aspect to it. But much more fundamental than that is that you don't address the real issue. So people think, and in fact, you make it worse. Um, so the real issue in the banking sector is that uh, the with the thing that people are pointing at is that if you have investment in retail banks together, then if you feel you have to bail out the retail bank always, then you're also going to end up putting money out for bailing out something you're not at all interested in, which is the, uh, the investment banking arm. So if you, if you make it an axiom that you always have to bail out re retail banks, then you're going to tend to want to separate. And that's exactly what was going on with, the, uh, with Vince Cable's arguments and the uh, Vickers Commission. But you shouldn't want to. About retail banks. First of all, retail banking is not obviously intrinsically less risky than investment banking. I just kind of chat that in as a point. But more fundamentally, what will a retail bank do if you guarantee that you're always going to bail it out? It'll do the riskiest things it can. It will lend to the riskiest businesses, but the dodgiest mortgages, the highest risk subprime consumer debt. Uh, and then, of course, in the boom times, that will all look good. And then in the bust, you'll have a huge real economy impact. It's all of these things that shouldn't have ever got any money go bust. You will increase macroeconomic volatility and you increase the implicit um, guarantee to the retail banks. Instead, you need to focus on resolution mechanisms which allow you to have a retail bank go bust just as much as an investment bank. If you make those work, you don't need to separate them anymore because it doesn't do anything. Okay, there was a cluster of hands over here. Can you just raise them again? Uh, okay, two questions then, close two together. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, answer this yet. Yes. Oh. So which, which was, of course, that. So, um, you, you, of course, will inevitably have a bit of each in different set areas. I think, though, that to a, a fairly high extent, you have to choose in a particular market. And so you have to choose whether the real driver is carrot or, or the real driver is going to be the government taking responsibility. I just have a quick question um, regarding you. It's provided some superb systemic analysis at the beginning as to why government got us into uh, the situation that we're in. And then you went on to say that, well, it's five years in, this is the longest that we've seen, this is quite noteworthy. Isn't it true that government got us into us and government is also prolonging it? Because I know you provided the orthodox, but 
from the Austrian um, economic perspective, the Austrian business cycle. We're not properly entering the trough. We're frozen in midair because of these capital guarantees, and it can't really, the system can't purge the malinvestment, if you will. It's and by providing these things, the government is making the situation even worse and prolonging the pain. Should we take a second question quickly and then come back to that? Uh, you mentioned at the start that it, the problem uh, is the revaluation of assets, as it were. And you used uh, railways in the 19th century as an example. Um, but there were numerous recessions in the 19th century based on railway speculation. What would you say account for the number of re-evaluations needed? Uh, sorry, I can not quite understand that question. You're saying that... So, so why do people have to re-evaluate the same asset again and again? I guess that's fairly simple in that they change their opinion more than once. Uh, so, uh, the, well, I guess I, it's probably not the place to go into an analysis of the 19th century uh, railway uh, uh, industry. Uh, next time. Yes, maybe <laughs> next time. But, uh, but my, uh, my short answer would be you, you end up with multiple re-evaluations. So you might have that was a problem and then have to spend a long time explaining why it wasn't. Um, on this question, the Absolutely, right? The governments have made things worse. Absolutely, the governments have made things worse. The government should not have bailed out the banks in 2008 um, uh, And it's absolutely extraordinary, both, uh, both in economic terms and in political, the failure of democracy that four years later, every few months, we still send a few more tens of billions to the banking sector, though now we've rebadged our banking sector bailouts as sovereign debt bailouts because somehow if you give it a different name, then that makes the same thing okay. Um, the, uh, uh, but, and what, one of the, I think there is every chance, there is definitely the, the, the prospect that in some uh, significant, uh, large, developed economy, we find that despite governments having put up of the order of trillions of pounds, euros, whatever, to save these things, these entities go bust anyway, dragging down large member states, right, in the way that they did in Ireland. If that happens, as it may well might, then these things will go down as the greatest folly in economic history, those parents. Um, the other thing about extending these things is that it's an exercise in denial, because uh, actually, the, it's not merely, it's more than simply, so people say, well, you've got a liquidity crisis, and or maybe it's a solvency crisis. There's a distinction between two kinds of solvency crisis as well. So if you have a solvency crisis just associated with past losses, and your enterprise is basically still a value-creating entity, well, I can recapitalize, and it will keep making money in the future. That's, that's okay, we can do that. But if what's going on is that your enterprise is no longer valuable, the world has changed in some way, which means that now the stuff, the way that you were, isn't worth having anymore, you're a value-destroying entity, 